I was asking to address what Klaus just asked me to, so you can see in the title. I started thinking about that, and if I could do that in 20 minutes, we really did need to have this conference. So therefore, what I did is we're going to give you a history lesson, a little bit on BLM. Because instead of federal lands, we want to talk about revested railroad lands in terms of the Bureau of Land Management. Because when you say federal, that includes National Park Service, Corps of Engineers, BIA, you know, trust lands, uh, BLM, Forest Service, wilderness. So they're all going to have different objectives and different mandates. And I want to make sure that we're very clear on what BLM's mandates are. So, topics. Description of revested lands, a history lesson, what our legislative mandate is, management tenants, and planning hierarchy. And we may skip that last part. Okay, revested railroad lands. U.S. Congress gave 24 uh, railroad grants for a total of 130 million acres. Anybody here from Texas? Good, because Congress gave your state away. That's how much 130 million acres is, is approximately the size of the state of Texas. But what we have in terms of the establishment of the Oregon and California lands, that was one of the 24 grants. Leland Stanford in the Central Pacific built a railroad from Sacramento to the California-Oregon border. Okay. Congress established the Oregon Tie Railroad Grant one year later in 1866. That was to go from Portland to the southern Oregon border. And here's where the fun begins. They were to get alternate sections for 20 miles each side of the railroad. Uh, indemnity lands were an additional 10 miles. Those are lands because the Willamette Valley was already settled, so you couldn't have every other section. You had to look somewhere else. So you got 12,800 acres for each mile of construction for 3,700,000 acres for a total of 290 miles of railroad from Portland to the southern Oregon border. State of Oregon was to designate the recipient of the grant lands, not the federal government. Now, here comes the fun part. The Oregon Central Railroad to Salem wanted to build the road and apply for it. And the Oregon Central Railroad in Portland wanted to build the railroad and apply for it. The one from Salem wanted to go down the east side of the uh, Willamette. The one in Portland wanted to go down the west side. Uh, the state of Oregon requested help from Congress to figure out what do we do when we have two Oregon Railroad companies. So in 1870, they passed a supplemental act clarifying the 1866 railroad grant. And it said, any railroad can get the grant. Didn't have to be the Oregon Railroad Company. Uh, but it added these three clauses to this grant that is unique to the state of Oregon. Grant lands are sold, are to be sold only to actual settlers. Sales are to be no larger than one quarter section, 160 acres. And sale price is to be no less and two dollars, or no more than two dollars and fifty cents an acre. This becomes very important. Ben Holland, Holiday, secured both Oregon Central Railroads. Okay, if you ever go to Portland and you're over by uh, uh, the Fairless Square on the Max Line, there's a Holiday Park by Lloyd Center. That's named for Ben. People liked him anyway, but. The way this worked is the U.S. government transferred the ONC lands to the state of Oregon. At one time, they were state lands. Okay? The state of Oregon transferred them to the railroad. And then the railroad was supposed to transfer them to the settlers. This is a biggie. The railroad was not liable for taxes until they actually took possession. The state of Oregon wanted to transfer them, and the railroad was just not in a real big hurry to do that. Okay? 
Okay, they, what they actually did was they built south along the east side of the Willamette. Here in Corvallis, you know where the town of Tangent is. Tangent was an ONC Railroad construction camp. It was established strictly by the ONC Railroad. And in 1872, the railroad reached Roseburg. And in 1873, Henry Villiard secured control of the Oregon and California Railroad uh, because the original investors went broke. Okay. In 1881, construction resumed uh, south along the South Umpqua River and Cow Creek Canyon to the Rogue Valley. In 1887, the Golden Spike was driven at Ashland. Okay. And that Golden Spike was very important because it completed the loop of railroads around the country. It was the last missing link. And then here, in the same year, uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad acquired control of the Oregon California, California Railroad lands, because the second company went bankrupt. And so this was actually transferred in a bankrupt, bankruptcy proceeding. So they were part of a private legal proceeding in the bankruptcy court. Southern Pacific stewardship. In the 1890s, Southern Pacific sold hundreds of thousands of acres for prices up to $40 an acre. Uh, one sale to a single purchaser was 45,000 acres at $7 per acre. Uh, so in 1902, Southern Pacific sold 400,000 acres to speculators and lumbermen. Remember those three added clauses in the 1870 Supplemental Act? Well, and they suspended still. In 1902, President Roosevelt appointed a special prosecutor to investigate waste, fraud, and abuse in the Oregon and California railroad lands. The federal government has been chasing waste, fraud, and abuse for over a century. In 1907, the Oregon legislature petitioned Congress to compel the railroad to meet the terms of the Oregon and California Act. Okay. In 1808, the Justice Department brings suit against Southern Oregon and Southern Pacific uh, oh, Southern Oregon Company, and the successor to the Coos Bay Wagon Road. The Coos Bay Wagon Road was also a land grant to build a road from Coos Bay to Roseburg to supply, uh, you know, uh, bring products from the coast into the valley, put them on the railroad. Okay. In 1913, the Federal District Court in Portland ruled that the Oregon California grant lands that had not been sold were forfeit. They didn't explain what forfeit meant. So in 1915, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress could dispose of the unsold Oregon and California grant lands in a reasonable amount of time. It gave them six months. So in 1916, the Chamberlain Ferris Act was passed, and that revested 2.8 million acres of Oregon and California grant lands back to the federal government. So they went out of federal ownership, they come back to the federal ownership in the general land office. And the, Fed, the Chamberlain Ferris Act said that the general land office was directed to sell the land and the timber as fast as possible. And what they were to do was to pay the railroad. The Supreme Court said, hey, you violated the act but you did build a railroad, so we owe you $2.50 for each acre. So the federal government had to buy the Oregon and California land back for $2.50 an acre. And so in order to do that, they distributed the revenues this way. This 40% reclamation fund is the sale of timber from the ONC lands paid for the ONC lands. Okay. Yeah, pay the railroad. 1919, the Coos Bay Wagon Road was also revested. That was 93,000 acres. And then in 1916 through 1937, timber sales were administrated, administered by the General Land Office. Terms were cash, and they were typically what the lumberman would pay. That nice uh, checkerboard ownership 
means the people who own the land around the ONC land could pretty much dictate the price of the timber. And that's one of the reasons why we have reciprocal right-of-ways today. Okay. Well, in 1926, there's a Stanfield Act. It was to relieve economic distress in counties because of lack of revenue from the ONC Act lands. Sounds a little bit like secure rural schools. Grant seven million to the counties. State received no money. You think secure rural schools, that's exactly the same way it is today. But in the 1916 formula for payments, they were made in place. 25 to the state, 25 to the counties, 10 to the treasuries, and 40% to the reclamation fund. In 1937, Congress finally got around to passing the Oregon and California Act. Okay, and Title I tells you how these lands are to be managed. Sustained yield, permanent forest production, and timber supply. Determine and declare annual productive capacity. Grazing, recreational facilities, protect watersheds, regulate steam flow, flow and power sites. Whew. Okay, the interpretation of this. Title I, in, 18, in 1982, BLM got a solicitor's office opinion. Says it is a forest production dominant role, but it does not mandate exclusive use. 1990, Ninth Circuit of Court in Wilcox Peak basically held up that the use of the Oregon and California lands is primarily for timber production, but it is not exclusive use. And in 2003, the Ninth Circuit reaffirmed that decision. It is still a dominant timber use, but it is not an exclusive use. But the ONC Act did change the way the payments were given. 15 or 50% went to the 18 ONC counties, 25% went to the Treasury to make payments to the Southern Pacific because we still owed them for part of the land, and then 25% went to the General Land Office to administer the ONC Act. So what this happened was when it was paid off, 75% was to go to the 18 ONC counties. And that's for use in general fund, not roads and schools, as with the Forest Service. 1953, plowback fund. Before the plowback fund, you had the 75-25 split. After the plowback, 50% goes to the 18 ONC counties, 25% to administer the ONC Act to the BLM, and then 25% to BLM to invest in the management of ONC lands. Uh, we have some very nice uh, seed orchards. We have some very nice recreation sites on BLM land. And that's to this 25% plowback. In 1982, BLM started to receive direct appropriations. This was kind of after NEPA, ESA. It became too expensive for us to manage lands on 25% of revenues. So Congress started giving us direct appropriations. Okay. And then in 2000, like I've mentioned, secure rural schools, it seems to be an act that has come around once again. And it just expired last Saturday. Okay. Management tenants, what we typically follow, we adhere to the grant provisions. Okay. And that is the 1937 ONC Act. It is the one that says these lands will be managed for this. Undivided loyalty, good faith. You know, we really follow the tenant, and our undivided loyalty is to do that and produce revenue. But we also are a prudent person and required to do due care and diligence, which means we comply with all laws. That includes ESA. NEPA, Clean Water Act, you know, Federal Advisory Committee Act, Equal Access to Justice Act, you name it, we'll comply with it because that's what a prudent person does. The other one is intergenerational equity. We do not, one favor, we do not favor one generation over the other. We do not cut all the trees today for revenue and deny future generations the revenue. 
And there's one up here that uh, legal scholars I've talked to will tell us is expanding. These are lands managed by a federal agency. So there is a duty to the public to provide public benefits to them. So it's just not timber and it's just not you know, recreation. It is kind of maintaining healthy watersheds. Okay. So this one is, well, dynamic. We've heard that word, I guess, over the past few days. Uh, planning hierarchy. You know, what we do, and we tell our folks, is there's several levels of planning. Federal law, we abide by it. That's kind of our highest priority. Department policies, procedures, guidelines. Second, resource management plans. We develop resource management plans for each of our districts. Landscape uh, plan or project plan. Could be a timber sale plan, it could be a multi-year timber sale plan, could be a stewardship plan. We have integrated prescriptions. We try to integrate all resources on the area. And then an activity prescription. What are we going to do tomorrow? Typically, these two are subject to NEPA. Although in the past, we have gone up into here and been required to do NEPA back on the Jameson strategy. That was rejected because you didn't do NEPA. If we do an integrated management prescription that is multi-resource, you know, I think the potential exists that we may well be required to do NEPA here. So if we end up doing NEPA at four different levels, you can see that that is a tremendous time constraint and expense. So with that, anybody need a horse? <laughs> BLM also manages horses. We have, happen to have currently 41,000 in long-term care. We can make, you, make sure that you have a selection of your choice. Uh, and so if you had a chance, adopt a horse. Please do so, because if you don't, next time we have a conference like this, we're going to include one with your registration packet. <laughs> That's it. Anybody questions? <laughs>